before I start this, I just want to have a conversation. Um, DevOps has been in everybody's mind for the last, how long? 10, 15 years, 15 years. We've done a really good job. We've done such a good job that everything we do is automated and it runs and nobody thinks about us anymore. We have to realize that um, our DevOps pipelines still need maturity because every time something new hits the market, the DevOps pipeline actually becomes a little older, even though we may not want to touch all of those workflow files that we've written and maintained for such a long period of time. It's an important conversation for us to have because we do not want to become um, irrelevant. And at a point in time where we have cybersecurity issues, we have digital transformation, and we have new AI technology being applied to software development. We should be, we should be the center, literally, we should be the center of the conversation, and we're not. So we have to all come together and start thinking about why we are not the center of, of, of discussion. Because it's the DevOps pipelines that has allowed Agile to progress. Um, it's, it, it has transformed the way we write software. We can, you know, thank Kosuke for building Jenkins years, years ago that taught us to automate everything. And this conversation is no longer, it's not happening. It's all about, you know, open source security. It's about AI. It's about Kubernetes. But none of that works without DevOps. So I'm just saying, we got to watch our backs. All right. And you're going to say, why? Well, let's start with this. You know, what is it with the cow and the alien <laughs> and the flying saucer? <laughs> no, it entertains me. <laughs> I'm likely putting my <laughs> facial on the calendar. It's entertaining. But it has a lot to do with what I'm going to talk about today. It's about collecting and gathering data. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, as I said, you know, we are executing CI CD pipelines all the time. Um, Mark, please tell me again, is it true? I know in the Jenkins, um, the CloudBees Jenkins kind of report, I think it said that you were doing something like 90 million Jenkins workflows a month. 90 million, 90 million. Think about that. And that's just CloudBees. That's not all the private Jenkins workflows. That's not CI CD. That's not Harness. That's not Spinnaker. That is just Jenkins. So we're executing these puppies all day long. And there's critical data that is hidden in the logs um, and across different tools. And consolidating this evidence will be important as we become relevant again. And we should make our job to become relevant again. Because they cannot, they, the other, everybody else in the world, cannot do it without us. <laughs> we are an important part of this puzzle. So where are your DevSecOps in, uh, insights? OK, so think about what I said earlier. We have AI hitting us. We have um, cybersecurity issues hitting us. But what hit us really first was this problem of these decoupled architectures microservices, Kubernetes. We used to have monolithic applications, and every monolithic application had pretty much one primary workflow. But then we started creating smaller components, and every component now has a workflow. Tools like Backstage try to help us generate, you know, create standard workflows faster, because we had to. Every time you, somebody wanted to build an API and d deliver that one API in a service, they had a workflow. So now we have a lot more workflows than we used to have. We have a, many of them running all over the place. And that creates fragmented data. So now we're being asked, for example, we had earlier discussion. I, I did a, um, ask the expert, uh, and thank you for those of you who showed up. I appreciate it. We talked about SBOMs. Well, every time you do a container build, you have a new SBOM. 
if you, are, if you have 50 containers in your application, you have 50 SBOMs. You also have 50 OpenSSF scorecards if you've taken the time to implement it. Or you have to implement it for every single one of them. So software architecture in this de decoupled you know, environment cr creates fragmentation that means that we can't even produce an application level SBOM in a microservices environment. So IT teams it really struggle to rein in software. We are really struggling to try to rein in what we're doing. Um, because we're managing all these, these, these workflows that are being executed across you know, our pipelines all day long with independently deployed objects going out, like this massive transformer that's running in production. Change management is a huge task. And developers and CISO teams really struggle for, they're literally for weeks just trying to determine which components may have been impacted by a new um, uh, vulnerability. I was at JFrog last uh, September, and they claim that it takes 227 days to fix a vulnerability. And when I asked that question, I said I was I did a talk later. I was like, was it 27 days? Or they were like, no, it's 227 <laughs> days, which is a long time. We we can do better, but this is part of the reason why. Okay, I am Tracy Reagan. I am, um, I served on the governing board of the OpenSSF. I also helped start the Continuous Delivery Foundation with Tracy Miranda, who used to be with CloudBees. Uh, I am still on the Continuous Delivery Foundation's Technology Oversight Committee, and I actually got to help start the Eclipse Foundation. So I'm not new to open source. I am the CEO and co-founder of the little company who could, called DeployHub. I'm the Ortilius community manager, and we are having this really cool, really funky, campy thing we call um, Secure, Ch uh, Secure Chain Con um, that's happening on May 24th. It's just so look for that on Twitch. Um, I am the uh, 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 co founder of Open Make Software, and I also co host Tech Strong Women TV. And we have some really amazing talks on there. So if you're into Tech Strong, please sign up, check me out on Tech Strong TV. All right, so we're going to talk today about an evidence store. And in fact, we're coming full circle from the, the sessions this morning. The DC talked about the importance of CD events and evolving the CD pipeline and the importance of using CD events instead of the way we have done it in the past. Um, and then we heard from um, Andrea, and he talked about the use of an evidence store for tracking that event data. So I'm, we're going to finish the story here. We're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about um, why we need an event uh, or a, an evidence store. Steve Taylor is going to sh uh, speak after me, and he's going to talk about how CD events is going to help us solve the security problem. Um, so what is Ortelius? Ortelius is an open source project. Please grab one of the uh, t-shirts over there. There's plenty of uh, alien t-shirts left. There's no more socks. I got the last one. <laughs> Um, and what Ortilius does, it turns raw data into meaningful insights. And when I'm talking about raw data, I'm talking about every little weird thing that you might need that you collect along the pipeline that you don't really even think about. And what it ends up is, is, is once we collect this fragmented data, we can do things like track open source usage and inventory across environments. We can track the vulnerability of the blast radius of a single vulnerability. We can say, oh, you're running log4j in these 15 uh, environment endpoints. This is, this is where you need to fix it. Uh, we can track organizational risk scorecards, or what's often being called now as um, application security posture management. We can track um, runtime environment audits and SBOM sharing and aggregation. And historical trends and versioning, which is super important for tracking threat modeling and understanding all your configuration metadata. Now, it doesn't live in a, necessarily in a silo. Um, the dream here would be for the CD Foundation, hopefully, to continue to grow and expand from where we are now. We've gone backwards a little bit, but I just gave you a lecture on why we should go forward. <laughs> and potentially, we could have a public version of Ortilius that's tracking open source software, SBOMs for open source software, configuration information about open source software. And you could have private information 
So a, a Discover card or a Chase or a Fidelity could have their own private version of, uh, of Ortelius. And with the information together, the private organizations can pull in that public information about open source packages and their configurations, and then ga gather that information at the higher level so that they're not living in a silo. That is the, the bigger dream, that you have this external information coming from these DevOps pipelines that we're consolidating to a, a central location with private, with private versions and public versions generating that high-level threat intelligence. And with that, we could do some really cool AI. And then we can start talking about AI DevOps, and we will get attention again. <laughs> Got to have that shoddy object. I am quite certain that we all have severe cases of ADHD because we, <laughs> we love our shoddy objects. We'll be going down this road, and all of a sudden, we're like, squirrel, <laughs> squirrel, AI. <laughs> Cybersecurity, open source software security, what is it that we should chase today? So why is the consolidated evidence needed? Because if you consolidate the evidence, you can start figuring out how to mitigate risks. You can start, we can start understanding patterns. We just heard I had a nice discussion on CICD patterns. We can start seeing software supply chain patterns. And it's going to provide us um, the, the security postures for what I like to call logical applications in decoupled environments. It's gonna help us track this inventory of open source software components. And it's really, in, the most important part of this is understanding the impact of a vulnerability. It, we, we need more than just an SBOM sitting in a build directory as a text file to do this. We have to use the information, we have to consume it. And that's what I believe the next, the next generation of DevOps pipelines will do. So let's just talk about some use cases for this. First of all, what is an application? In a decoupled environment, is a single container, a single feature set of microservices, is that an application? Well, not according to the US government. If you're delivering software to the US government, then they're gonna ask you for an SBOM for your entire application. Ortelius is a, has, I think, 14 microservices, something like that. So if we have to generate an SBOM for Atilius or for Deploy Hub, we have to generate an aggregated one because it's not just one container, it's multiple containers. And every container has its own build process. So what is a logical application is a discussion that we should be having. Um, and even going back to CD events, we should be looking at our vocabulary and saying, is an application, what is an application? Is it a project, is it a, is it a repo? And of course, everybody has to start thinking about why we should be uh, worried about SBOMs. Most of us don't deliver uh, software to the US government, but why is the US government asking those companies that do deliver software to the US government to generate an SBOM? It's because that data is critical. It's critical for tracking the vulnerabilities. So in the Ortelius world, we, uh, aggregate data. So we collect it from the lower levels, we aggregate it up to logical application levels. And a logical application is a collection of independently deployed components that is delivered to an end user. A simple concept, we used to have it in regular CI CD, but it's not so simple anymore. Open source inventory management. If you were trying to chase down a problem, a log per J, for example, or a log per shell, however you want to describe it. How do you know if it's impacted you? Do you are you executing it, and what version are, is being actually consumed and executed in your runtime environments? By gathering and mapping S, the uh, com component level SBOMs, we can begin to see that information from a central point of view. So right now, Artilius does this quite well. Um, I think I was gonna take this out because Steve will probably talk about it, but you just need to know that one, one search will deliver what you need. You search for a pack, you do a package search on Log4j or Spring or whatever it is, and you're going to see everywhere that it's been deployed. And this is the features that the open source community has already delivered. Vulnerability impact. 
um, what is the blast radius of that vulnerability? Where am I being impacted? What components are consuming it? What logical applications are being impacted? And where is it running where I should be worried about the most? There is a, a, quite, a, quite a bit more data that we we're tracking, but I just want to cover some of the high-level uh, use cases so you can think about it. So when we track vulnerability, what we, we do is we take an application and we know from the application all of the components. We take every component SBOM and we normalize it and we provide that information for that particular application. When I say normalize it, if all of them are using the same versions of certain packages, we only report it once because we're giving an aggregated view of a logical application in a decoupled architecture. Now from there, Ortelius then goes out and pulls um, OSV dev, I believe, Steve, uh, about every 10 minutes or so, even though it's probably only updated every hour, to produce a brand new vulnerability report constantly. So it's continuously reporting that. And from there, we can see what environments it's been deployed to. So what is the data that we're, we're tracking? We are super excited about working as closely as possible with the OpenSSF community. They are doing a great job of building um, solutions that we can implement in the, the DevOps pipeline, but they're not automating them. So we have a role in this game. We have an important role. and We need to sort out the best way to pull the data into a central evidence store, whatever that evidence store might be. Ortilius is an open source one. And some of the tools include um, security scorecard. We should be able to track a salsa, uh, how, how compliant a, a build is from a salsa point of view. Uh, pulling in SBDX format SBOMs and using OSV dev. And then of course you can't talk about anything without mentioning SIFT, which is a Encore uh, OpenSSF member and uh, project. And SIFT is a Cyclone DX uh, format. So here's what we're delivering today. We're delivering postures, security postures. This is a security posture of an application you see way on the left-hand left -hand corner there, the application. The components, which are individual microservices, and their scores to the right for things like sonar cube. Uh, I think we have a Veracode in there, their Git triggers, uh, and, and other uh, related data, inclu including licensing and some information about the environments. We are adding more and more of this kind of data into uh, Ortilius to really create that uh, security posture that CISO offices are looking for. Developers don't care much about this. We as DevOps professionals have additional information now that we have to provide to management, and it's this kind of data that they're looking for. And developers, they've got plenty of work to do. They don't need to be trying to figure out how to generate an SBOM for a a, a container build that was executed in the pipeline. It is our job as DevOps pros and engineers to start embracing the security tools that are being offered through the OpenSSF and other uh, commercial vendors. There's a lot of evidence that we gather. Uh, you know, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. So I'm going to just go through a few things. I said we could potentially do some really interesting things with AI. So I'm just going to go th through a few, and then I'm going to pass it off to Steve. First of all, wow, if we could do this, automatically remediate a known vulnerability by redeploying, rebuilding and redeploying the artifacts, why not? Isn't that what we should be doing? First of all, if we gather the data in Ortilius, Ortilius knows where it was deployed, it knows the workflow that was executed, so it knows how to rebuild the object. It knows the S, it has the S, would have the SBOM data, so it knows the dependencies. It would also know what package was at fault. Now, potentially we could use AI to go find us the correct package, bring it in to the, the, uh, the workflow, and push it back through the, the pipeline. And understanding the blast radius, we could do it for every application that's been impacted. So those 227 days, if we're talking about fixing the problem, 
we as DevOps engineers, we can get it done in an hour. <laughs> if we have the right process, right? If we have the right data, the right process, and some applied AI, we have the ability to automatically fix this. I know I'm a dreamer, that's why I'm a star I, I run startups. But it's possible we have the data and we can do it. So this is one of Steve's kind of pet peeves. Um, you know, determine why a repository, a repository is high risk and produce the needed security tools to fix it. This is another step that we could take. We have, we have data that says that we know that this, these are the problems with this particular repo. Let's go fix it. For example, if no dependency tool is used, then let's use uh, Dependabot or Renovate and create a pull request to say, hey, this is a new GitHub action that you should be creating or this should be added to your Jenkins workflow. And then ensuring that old versions of open source and third party packages are not consumed. Oh, we never do that, right? <laughs> we never ever do that. And those are the, pe the pieces that are the most vulnerable. Uh, and that, that all happens in the build. It's obfuscated. You really can't see it easily. Uh, this is another piece that, of the pie that we could t totally take on and fix if we were looking at data from a DevOps perspective and applying AI to it. And then there's three others. There's historical data. Could be used to evaluate threat models. Everybody sits in a room, looks at their threat models. Maybe we should be evaluating them and making and, and getting, giving feedback to say, this isn't the best threat model. It didn't really ever happen. Historical trends can show, show us that if we tracked it. Analyze uh, company-wide use of an open source project to predict the most critically uh, impactful to, uh, packages. If everybody's consuming log4j, which we did, we, were, we, we, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot. We had so much, everybody was relying on that one particular package. And that's kind of what taught us the lesson. And then report and remove unused packages from the build. Why put them in there if you don't need them? We, but we do that because we just don't know. And AI could help us solve that. We can't do it manually. It's just too big of a problem. And we can't do it without the understanding the data. So we can collect the data, and that's what these evidence stores are for. And there's one more thing. Aliens are real. <laughs> they truly are. We have a couple of them sitting in the, in, in the aisles here. This is the Ortelius governing board. Garima and Brian are on the um, governing board. We have Steve Taylor, um, who, who sits on the board as well. And all these folks are amazing. They really are amazing people, and they've worked really, really hard on this project. And then we have an amazing TOC. Um, Vincent Dannon from Red Hat. He's VP of Product Security at Red Hat. Brian Fox, everybody knows Brian um, from Sonotype. Um, Grima, Adam uh, Gardner, and Steve Taylor. So to them, I thank them all for their effort and the amazing programmers and committers that we have on the Ortelius project who has made this an exciting new project that's being pushed by a company as small as Deploy Hub. We do not have a big company behind us. We would like one, so if you're out there, we're gonna ask for you to join us. And thank you. Thank you very much for um, listening to my story about my facial being on the calendar <laughs> uh, and my, my preaching about let's make ourselves relevant again. And how do we shift? How do we pivot? It's time. And on that, I'm going to have Steve come up.